Dear Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you that it is like that evening on the road to Emmaus, when it was toward evening and the day was far spent, and you drew near to your two friends. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for the way you were availed to them as you broke bread at supper time. And Lord, we would ask you to break bread to us this evening so that we may eat your life and eat you and be more like you, Lord Jesus. We ask this for your glory. Amen. Well, loved ones, we're coming to the end of this evening series this year because you know at the end of this present month we begin to have the outdoor services where the elders and the other brothers and sisters in the body begin to speak and to lead the worship time. And so through June, July, August, we'll meet on the whole uh, in the university mall, probably somewhere, and uh, on very cold evenings, then we'll meet inside. But throughout the services, we'll be led by ourselves. And so this is the end of our present series this year on the spiritual life. Of course, we have two more years to finish it, but uh, this is the end this month. So we have three evenings after tonight, and I would like to use them to try to deal with subjects that God has made clear to us we need to uh, elaborate on in regard to what we've dealt with during this quarter, or these two quarters. But tonight, we promised that we'd have questions and question time. So I do think that just by, after pointing you to one verse and commenting briefly on it, then you should just ask questions. And I will really try to answer them in, in a simple and plain, a comprehensible way. Uh, First John, loved ones, and chapter 1 and verse 9. 1 John 1 and verse 9, and it's page 1065, 1065, 1 John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And our studies during these past two quarters have been based on the last clause of that verse and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we've tried to emphasize that being right with God is living the way he wants us to live and our personalities operating the way he meant them to operate. And we've often shared how the greater part of Christendom seemed to have majored on the clause previous to that one, and will forgive our sins. And that is a very integral part of the work of Jesus in his death, that because of it, God is able to forgive us our sins. And we're able to be reconciled to him and be not only as friends, but be as children. But the precious thing to all who met Christians in the first century was that these Christians had not only come into the favor of God, but had been restored to the image of God. And so they had not only ceased to be enemies of God and become his friends, but they had ceased to be creatures, and they'd become the children of God. So they not only knew God, but they looked like God. And that's why hundreds of people turned to Christianity, because they saw that the children of God were cleansed from unrighteousness and were living like the Savior that they testified about. And we have shared in these evenings that that's the greatest need in our world. It's amazing how many people have heard the gospel and how many people know that God loves them and how many people believe that God is willing to forgive them 
But it's amazing how few people who know all those things have ever met Jesus in the flesh. And that is, of course, the great privilege that we're given to present Jesus in the flesh to other people so that they not only have this word here, but they have the witness of another person who lives like Jesus. And you remember we've shared that living like Jesus means that we have to operate the way Jesus operated. And Jesus got his approval and his significance and his security and his happiness from God, his dear Father. And one of the great changes that has to take place in our life is that we have to begin getting our security and our significance and our happiness from our dear Father. And we find that many of us who are born of the Spirit do not get our security and significance and happiness from our Father. But we get our security from our jobs and from our money and from our bank account. And we get our significance from the way our friends and our peers treat us. And we get our happiness from the love and the attention that our wives and our friends give us. And many of us have found that we actually just live like ordinary men and women. Even though we're born of the Spirit and we have Jesus' Spirit and the Spirit of God inside us, Yet we don't seem to get all we need from God. We seem to get it from all other people around us and from other things. And one of the great needs we have is to be freed from that. And that's what we've discovered, of course, Jesus did for us. That what, in fact, God did when he saw a whole race of people who lived from other people's approval and from other people's sense of attention, he destroyed them in Jesus. He crucified them and buried them in Christ and it destroyed completely that old creation and raised it up in Jesus anew. And that's what has potentially happened to us. And that's what can happen by faith. We can, by faith, be crucified with Christ and be raised up so that instead of living from the outside in, we live from the inside out. So instead of being a gasoline engine into which we're trying to feed diesel oil, we suddenly have the gasoline engine buried and done away with and a diesel engine put in its place so that the oil of the Holy Spirit can work the way he was meant to work through us. So the whole apparatus that we have, the whole intern perverted personality that causes us to cry out the good that I would, I cannot, and the evil I hate is the very thing I do, that was destroyed with Jesus and raised up. And we are able to enter into that by faith in an instance. And uh, I was impressed by God that in the introduction, though I should keep it short, I should stress to you that being delivered from selfish will being delivered from anger and envy and jealousy is done in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, in an instant. And he impressed upon me to point out to you that even though you don't know Greek, there are two Greek tenses that express an action that takes place in the past. One is the perfect tense, I have died. And the emphasis is that because of an action in the past, I am dead in this present moment. And uh, that's one tense in the, in the Greek language. And it emphasizes something that has happened in the past. There is another tense called the aorist, A-O-R-I-S-T, aorist. And we don't have it in English. But it emphasizes an event took place in the past in one instance. And it's done. And it is always the aorist tense that is used when the Bible talks about us being crucified with Christ. It's done in a moment. Though there are many tenses that emphasize that we should continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the tenses that talk about being baptized with the Spirit are the aorist. They are tenses that say it's done in a moment, in an instance. And so one of the things we have talked about during these quarters is that we are delivered from our carnal, selfish will in a moment by a crisis experience of being crucified with Christ and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we've discussed, too, you remember, soulishness, that even after a person wants to glorify Jesus above everything else,
and is freed from the desire to glorify himself or herself so that they can be gentle and they can be kind and they can be loving. They're at last freed from that terrible urge to lose their temper. They're at last freed from that terrible urge to criticize other people and they in fact find a fountain of sweet water flowing up from inside them. The spirit that Jesus promised would flow from the innermost being. Even though they find that, they discover they have a personality that they inherited from their dad or their mom or their great-grandfather or their great-great-grandfather and it has traits in it that are not sinful in a sense. And yet in a sense they are sinful, it's just they're unconsciously sinful. They have a gruff voice, or they have a bad memory, or they have uh, an insensitivity to people that they inherited from their father or their mother, or they have a strange, facetious way of talking that makes people feel uncomfortable. Those personality traits, that soulishness, is then something that is dealt with by the daily application of the cross of Christ to our personality traits. And that is the process experience of being crucified with Christ, or the process experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So during this year, we have talked about those two events, one instantaneous deliverance through identifying ourselves with Jesus in a death to self and to its rights and to its ways, by which we are delivered from the selfish will and then a daily experiencing of the cross of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit and through breaking experiences and through the revelation of the Spirit by which we are delivered from those inexpedient personality traits that prevent the Holy Spirit pouring through us in the same free way that he poured through Jesus. I think I should stop because otherwise I'd just go on and on because it is so good and it's so true. So, are there any questions, loved ones? I asked you if you would think of questions for tonight, and, and if you haven't, I'll just preach. I, I, but. Hebrews 10, 26 and 27, loved ones. For if we sin deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful ju prospect of judgment and a fury of fire, which will consume the adversaries. And brother, you're saying that it seems that forgiveness of our sins is conditional upon a knowledge of the truth. Yeah. Well, yes, all I can, and I don't know, brother, what Jesus is showing you or, or the exact point you're getting at, but I certainly believe that you can only have your sins forgiven if you do know, first of all, that God is willing to forgive your sins, and then if you do fulfill the conditions that are necessary to be forgiven. And I, I can liken it to an experience of a personal uh, disagreement or a personal offense that we might have uh, among ourselves. It seems to me that if you do something against me, even though you may know that, well, he's a loving kind of guy and a forgiving kind of guy and he probably forgives me, yet you can have no experience personally of reconciliation to me until you come and say, look, uh, brother, I'm sorry I did that to you. I really am, and I ask you to forgive me. And forgiveness is the restoration of a relationship. Forgiveness is not an abstract concept that you believe in and therefore you've experienced. Forgiveness is only worth even talking about if it is experienced by, by people. And the best definition I've found of it is it's the restoration of a relationship. And that's why I have real trouble with this concept that is often shared, oh, God loves you. That's all you need to know, God loves you. Well, I think many of us knew God loved us, 
but it did not change our lives until we stood for forgiveness personally to him and had the relationship between ourselves and him restored and then received his spirit. Is that? So I, yes, I, I think. I think it has to be a personal action, loved ones, between us and God. Uh, the issue is not whether God loves us. That, that's, a, that's silly. The issue is not whether God loves us. And uh, with due respect to you loved ones who say, oh, I don't know if God loves me. I don't know if God loves me. Loved ones, that's a rough one, you know. When you see Jesus bleeding on the cross, and you see that his death is the best attested fact of history, it's hard, you know, for you to continue to say, God, you're not sure God loves you. I feel this, if I may say it, that you see the wrathful face of God because you are still not obeying him. And therefore you see his wrathful face. And his wrath is a precious, precious quality that God uses to draw us away from our sinful ways and our disobedience. And if it weren't for the wrath of God, who of us would ever turn towards him if we did not see some of the results of his wrath? That is, some of, many of them are built-in responses and reactions of our own body and our own personality when we operate in a way other than the one he has planned. And so the wrath of God is a precious thing. But I wonder, uh, for those of you who cannot believe that God loves you. I really wonder if it's an intellectual problem. I don't think it is. I think it's a moral problem. I think you don't believe God loves you because you are not the kind of guy or the kind of girl at the moment that God could love because you are still resisting his will consciously in your life. Earl says, you know, that resisting of the will is the key to the whole business. And, and I know where he speaks from because he was on the West Coast writing me the wildest letters at one time. Because he himself, you know, and if you don't mind me, because I think you'd give your own testimony if, if you were up here, uh, but was resisting God's will often and yet knowing much about God. And loved ones, I can't tell you how much that's the key. It's resisting, resisting God's will. That's the key to everything. Loved ones, what we want is not more even singing in the Spirit. Believe me, you know. That, God will give us that. By all means, let's have plenty of it. But that's not what we need, you know. You, you so often want to believe what I need is more power, more power. What you need is more realization of your own weakness. And then God would give you power. But the key is aligning your will with God's will in every detail. That's the key, every time. It's submission of your will to his. If you do that, you'll come through to everything. In Belfast, we used to have a place called the Coleman's Mission. And the Coleman's Mission Hall was built in the shipyard area of Belfast. One of the worst areas, if any of you have lived in ports, you know that the area nearest to the docks is usually the poorest and the worst area to live in. And the Coleman's Mission Hall was built there. Now, Coleman in Ireland, I've shared with some of you before, Coleman in Ireland, even uh, when I was in Ireland in my teens, Coal men were people who delivered the coal to our houses by horse and cart. I know it sounds out of this world, but to me it seems yesterday that they were delivering coal by, house, uh, by horse and cart. And these poor souls, of course, sat on these carts, and the Irish rain blasted upon them, and they carried the bags of coal into the houses on their backs. And of course, they were covered in coal dust. 
And, I mean, I never remember, I never think of them as wearing ordinary clothes. It seemed to me they were always wearing rags because everything was black coal dust. And if you saw one of these poor guys sitting on the cart with the old horse, the kind that the Budweiser has, you know, those horses, <laughs> sitting there going through the old Irish streets with the rain blasting down, he looked the most miserable creature alive. He looked the most degraded of humanity. He looked hardly a person, really. And the coal men's mission hall, in that coal men's mission hall, loved ones came to the highest points of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. They came to the highest points of sanctification. I knew a coal man who had come to a place with Jesus that was free and beautiful and filled with love. And they had no complicated doctrine of the Holy Spirit in that mission hall. In that mission hall, they preached, submit your will to God, and he will give you all that you need in your life. And so that's really trust and obey, for there's no other way. That's finally all that is needed to enter into all of God's riches. It's interesting to elaborate them, because here we are a very... Uh, sophisticated, we think ourselves, intellectual type of people. And so we like to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. But actually we'd enter into everything if we just obey God. Yes, good. Okay, Jane. Uh, the question is, uh, if you find yourself uh, with difficulties in regard to personality traits, um, and yet you uh, ought to believe that you are crucified with Christ, you find the two are contradicting one another. And the personality traits, uh, brother said, you find yourself lashing out at someone. So let me try to elaborate just so that at least we keep the definitions as clear as I think scripture makes them. When we say lashing out at someone, normally I think we mean we lose our temper or we're critical or cutting towards them. Now, maybe I should state clearly that by soulishness, we don't mean that. Uh, that's just downright carnality. That is, uh, that is the kind of quality that is mentioned, loved ones, in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 1, and I know, brother, you just chose that and didn't necessarily mean it, but I think it gives an opportunity to clarify. Uh, page 992, uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 1, but I, brethren, could not address you as spiritual men, pneumatikos, you remember, is the Greek word, but as men of the flesh, sarkikos is the Greek word, carnal, it's translated in King James, as babes in Christ. And then, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. And even yet you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. Sarkikos, you are carnal. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving like ordinary men? Now, strife is lashing out at people. It's responding to people in a critical, sarcastic, cutting way. It's losing your temper with people. And it comes because you're still carnal. You're still of the flesh. You're still behaving like ordinary men. And you do that because you're still responding to people and events. Your life is still dominated by what other people do to you or what other things happen to you. And that's because you are still living in dependence on other people and in dependence on outside events. And that's because your personality is still working in. You're feeding yourself from what comes in through your body. And so when somebody treats you right and gives you respect, 
You're pleased. You take that through your eyes and your ears, comes into your emotions, and gives you a nice feeling. And you feel secure, and you feel important. But whenever they don't give you that kind of respect, whenever they give you disrespect or contempt, then that feeds through to you, riles up your emotions, and you feel they're not treating me the way they should, or they're not giving me the respect that they should, and so you immediately respond out to them in a way that attacks in order to defend yourself. Now that's because you're still depending on other people and other things for your security, significance, and happiness. That means you're carnal. That means you have not reckoned yourself to be dead indeed unto sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That means you have not entered in to the great blessing of crucifixion with Christ that he wrought on the cross for you. That means you are not willing to be crucified with Christ. That's the only reason you don't enter in, because you are not willing to be crucified with Christ. You're not willing to be treated with contempt. You're not willing to be treated with disrespect. You're not willing to go down the Via Dolorosa as he did and have people spit upon you and swear at you. You're not willing for that. So you want to go into heaven with him, but you aren't willing to go down into the grave with him. And because you're not willing, you're still carnal, and you need to experience the crisis, co-crucifixion with Christ in your life. Now, that's what we talk about in regard to temper. And then when we talk about personality traits or soulishness, we're talking about things that do not necessarily appear very wicked or evil or sinful on the outside. Though I think it is true what John Spaulding mentioned to me one evening, that it is true they are unconscious sins still. But they are things like having a great deal of human love. So you're a very loving person. And there are some of us that had mums that were just would take the whole world of children to themselves. And we inherited from our mums a very strong human love. And so when we came to Jesus and were crucified with him, we wanted to love everybody, but we loved them with our human love. And that human love is at times very binding. Because at times the human love goes out to others and then it wants a little of itself back. And so it enjoys itself in loving. So it isn't absolutely at the beck and call of the Holy Spirit. It tends to be at the beck and call of other people still, and yet ostensibly it's not because we're getting something from it. And yet it is dependent on other people's stimuli of us. And so it's not absolutely free and under the control of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's what we mean by human trait. A trait that is probably good in a human sense, but it is strong with human strength and not strong with the strength of the Holy Spirit. And it is finally, at the end of the day, governed and...